Would you join me now in a word of prayer? Come Holy Spirit, come. Through the imperfect words of this imperfect disciple, we ask that you might illuminate for us your word, your word of life, your word of challenge, your word of justice, your word of love. Come Holy Spirit, come, envelop us, envelop us this day with your love. Amen. So this first Sunday after Easter is a hard place to be for some of us as people of faith. As during the Advent and Christmas season, we have just spent a bunch of weeks in preparation, weeks in the holy season of Lent, and finally that week called Holy, following Jesus at last to the cross and rejoicing last Sunday in the resurrection of Jesus. We made it. We did it all, from the trial, to the betrayal, to the Last Supper, and to the empty tomb. We went there. We stayed there for a moment. We reflected there. Now, the crowds of last week are choosing something else to do this morning. We now move into a time in the church calendar called the 50 Days of Easter, a season that takes us all the way to Pentecost Sunday, and we think maybe to ourselves, 50 Days of Easter? Wasn't that Sunday last week enough for all of us? Now, I understand some pastors even take a vacation the Sunday after Easter, as soon as Easter has passed. Some even invite a guest preacher to come and preach in their pulpit the Sunday after Easter, but vacation or not, from school, from church, from work, we are right in the middle of the season of Easter. Now, it is possible that if you're feeling that way, maybe the disciples felt that way too. While we have relived these eventful moments in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, by recreating the days with what we know from Scripture, the closest followers of Jesus were first-hand witnesses to those events. Now, while we might envy the privilege that they had of walking and talking and seeing Jesus in the flesh, I don't envy what must have been a personal roller coaster their lives must have been during this time. And so, after Mary Magdalene and the women just sung about, witnessed a risen Jesus, the disciples find themselves sort of in a place that we might call limbo, not knowing where to go from here. They're in a waiting mode, waiting for some signal, some sign about what they are to do next. They're looking for a disciple's blueprint to know what do you do after the one that you have followed has been raised from the dead. And suddenly, as scripture accounts, Jesus appears to them and offers a word, and that word is peace. And so in the lesson for today, there are two 
really important vignettes for us, each one of them important, and I think each one of them offers a challenge to those of us who follow Jesus. So first, Jesus breathes literally into them the Holy Spirit, or God's holy breath, the ruach, or the pneuma of God's Holy Spirit. He commissions them, he sends them out, he says, as the Holy Spirit has sent him, so he is now sending them. And then he says this really challenging thing. You might have missed it. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Okay? He didn't stop there. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That causes me to gulp for a moment. I think those words are fairly shocking. I also think they're quite puzzling to try to figure out. I don't know about you, but I don't really want that kind of power from Jesus. And I'm not sure what he would be thinking to grant it to all of us. We read elsewhere how often we're supposed to forgive people. You know the math equation, 70 times 7. That we ought to pray that God would forgive us as we forgive others. We just prayed that a moment ago. You may not know, but the world is not necessarily big on forgiveness these days. To place forgiveness in us, the hands of the believers, is something that should at least cause us to pause for a moment and to think about it. This statement seems almost impossible for us to even imagine. But still, that statement is there. We cannot deny it. We cannot turn it away. We cannot cut it out of the Bible. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What? I ask again, what? If you wrong me and I refuse to forgive you, does God forever hold that wrong against you as well? Is my forgiveness all God needs to be convinced to forgive us as well? Like I said, I don't really want to have that much power that kind of power, because I would fear that I wouldn't always live by it, I might even abuse it, that I would not be able to forgive and let go as Jesus asks us to do. And yet, I don't have a choice about that. We don't have a choice about that. Jesus says, you have the power. I think he was trying, perhaps, to remind us of the power that we actually have as human beings. And perhaps our biggest mistake about that power is when we act as if we don't actually have it. True, we don't decide who God does and does not forgive. But I actually don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I think he's trying to remind us that beyond what God does, all of us come into that equation. What we do, how we treat one another on this earth, how we forgive or not, 
really matters. It really makes an impact. It's not easy, but it's true. And then we move into the famous passage of our friend, you know his name, Doubting Thomas. He's been absent while Jesus was with them. He's not seen the resurrected Christ with his own eyes, and when others tell Thomas the news, what does he do? He says, I don't believe it. Not without seeing him for myself as you have seen him for yourself. Who can blame him? Thomas says, unless I see with my own eyes, I will not believe. So if we're honest with each other, I'm guessing we might be in the same boat as Thomas. You need only to think of someone who you have lost, who was close to you, and hearing reports that they were actually alive after all. Would you believe it? I think Thomas speaks for all of us when he asks for some tangible proof of what the disciples are reporting to him. We all like to have our facts straight. We like our facts. And there's a great debate in our culture about what facts are actually facts. It's only responsible, after all, because we live in this age of reason to support our claims with substantiated evidence. So, Jesus shows up. And he shows himself to Thomas, and Thomas is able to have the proof that he is looking for and find his faith in what the other disciples have been telling him all along. Jesus doesn't criticize Thomas, but simply leaves them all with this blessing and challenge in the, in the phrase, blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. So your minds may be thinking about what falls into that category for you. There's much that you and I haven't seen and yet we believe in this world. We rely on the proof of others, don't we? We rely on the knowledge that they have for our faith. For me, that pretty much falls into the matters of science and technology. For example, I know how to turn my laptop on. I do. I can't really explain to you, however, how on earth, when I type something, I hit send and have it instantly sent to my friend in South Africa. Not a chance that I could tell you how that actually happens, but I believe that it does. We can believe in the science that makes planes fly, cameras on our phones, capturing a picture for all eternity if we remember to save it. Phones, no less, that transmit wirelessly across the world, tests for COVID-19, because we trust people that we will never meet or know to understand, to prove, to invent, and to be our best selves. But 
for the intangible, we still are pretty much skeptics. We believe in love as a concept, perhaps. We just fail to believe that we might be worthy of that unconditional love that God has for each one of us as God's children. And we fail to believe that it's important for us to freely give our love to others without condition, without a set of rules, just to love people as God has created them to be. We've heard all about this grace thing, but we still don't always believe that God gives it to us for free. For free. Grace is free. We certainly don't like it when God may be giving that grace out to people that we don't like so much. And we believe that Jesus died and rose again, but that doesn't convince us that he taught us something that was important enough for us to actually try to follow him. So what will it take for us to believe? What is the proof that you're looking for? What is the proof that I'm looking for? What will convince us and convict us so much of who Jesus was, how he lived, and how he loved, that we would actually want to follow him, to be a disciple of Christ, that we want to seek to live and love the way that he did, unconditionally. Thomas wanted the proof, and Jesus actually was able to give it to him. But remember what he said next to all of them. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. So here it is. The facts have been presented to us. We have followed Jesus from life to death and then to new life again. We have heard him teach and preach. We've listened to the stories of his healing, his miracles. We've heard him call us to do the same thing, likewise, over and over again. We have heard about God's incredible love for all of us. Friends, the testimony's in. Now is our moment to deliberate and to decide. Our task is no small one, and Jesus knows it. But the blessedness of belief that comes even when it comes from our faith and not from tangible proof is real. Through believing, we have life, real life, blessed life, rich and full, life worth living in the name of Christ. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have come to believe.